can do what I feel like I need to do. Um, you've, um, you've come here from everywhere, and we're honored to have you. We're very honored that you're here. Um, a lot of times in these sessions, I'm not sure what to share or who, to, who that I'm talking to. So I figure if I stay with the gospel, I'm pretty safe. Um, a lot of times when I know I'm dealing with the pastors from this particular country, there's, there's a way to deal with it. But there are certain things that all of us in ministry deal with that kind of go across the board. And you've heard from a lot of people this week, and you will hear from a lot more tomorrow or tonight, rather, and in the morning, you'll hear from Pastor and Steve again. And uh, you must understand that I uh, view, I probably view everything a little different, or I'll come at it a little different angle than maybe the other people you've heard, probably because, I don't know, it's just, it's just who I am, and I'm a musician, and I've kind of, in the middle, I don't really know what I am or who I am. I, I'm... I was called to preach when I was 17, and I pastored for about four years, and then I wound up back in music again. So I don't really know if I'm a preacher or a pastor, an evangelist or a musician. I, I know I'm not a singer. I'm an adequate keyboard player. So I don't really know. When I was growing up, uh, I grew up in the States. I, grew, I was born in St. Louis, Missouri, which is the middle of the United States. And, uh, and we attended, uh, on Sunday morning we went to a church that had mostly white folks in it, but on Friday night and Saturday night we went to a Church of God in Christ church that was all black folks. So I don't really know which camp I fit in. I know I'm a white boy, but I don't know, I'm just kind of... God just stuck me in the middle. And I used to fuss about it all the time. Because I always thought, why God do I seem to wind up at places where people are here, and I sense that you want to take them here, why must I always be in the middle? Does anybody else ever feel that way? Why must I always feel like I'm pulling somebody to come this way? And, and anytime you're trying to be a bridge builder, anytime you're trying to bring someone from point A to point B, uh, there has to be a way to get there. And the shortest way is, uh, you know, the shortest point, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. But the problem is, is you want to make sure you bring as many people with you without spilling the cart too badly on the turns. And it's, it's just real interesting. Also, being a musician is very controversial. Um, especially here in the Western Church, and I'm sensing around the world, it's controversial. If you notice, i tell you something I found out that's real interesting. Someone can be a preacher of the gospel or an evangelist, and you really don't know what camp he is from. You don't know if they're evangelical, you don't know if they're liturgical, you don't know if they're Pentecostal, they're charismatic, until the music starts. And the music seems to define where they're from and what they are and what cultural background they have and from what area of ministry they're coming from. And uh, it's real interesting. The church musically has always been stuck. They're always fighting about it, probably always will. I've resigned myself to that and I've no longer felt that I am the, the caped crusader for music in the world. Uh, I figured that this is a long, long battle that went on before me and will probably continue after me. I just do what I do from my heart. What you see that I do is what I am. I can't do other things. Uh, I can fake a lot of things and, and pretend a lot of things, but I love soul music. I love rock and roll. I love hymns. I love country. I love classical. I love it all. Now, there's a few of those things I cannot play, and I admit it hands down. But I always find the church in this great heated controversy of music. And when you look back in history, you see that Spurgeon, Wesley, 
every great man of God, every great move of God has had the same controversy of music attached to it. And uh, I suppose that it probably will never be settled, so I'm not even going to address it this morning or this afternoon because I don't care anymore. <laughs> I'm to a place that either God is blessing what you're doing or he's not. And you can get up and beat yourself to death trying to please people and you'll kill yourself. Now, the other thing you can do is you can try to force feed people and they'll kill you. If you try to make them something they're not. A lot of worship leaders and musicians and pastors talk to me and say, listen, Lindell, I'm trying to get my church to go a certain direction in worship. I want to see them really express themselves. We want to open up our music department and go a different direction. And I said, the first thing I say is, whoever's leading them, are they a friend of the church? Do the people like them? Because if the people don't like who's leading, they won't follow. I don't care if you've got the latest word from God and you could part the Red Sea. If people don't feel a connection with you, if they don't feel like they love you and there's, they don't feel like you care for them, that you pastor them. Brownsville, the music at Brownsville now is nothing like it was five years ago. But I didn't walk into Brownsville to change it. I walked into Brownsville and did exactly what they were used to hearing until revival came. Then when revival came, all the rules went away. And I realized that what would, what would minister to the local body of Brownsville was not ministering to the world that was coming. Because many of you here today are from various countries. You're not from America. While music is universal, very universal, melody and rhythm is universal, the things that pull our heartstrings in the south, in the southern part of America, do nothing for you. I can sing, everybody will be happy over there, and many international guests look at me and go, while little grandmother who was raised in the south, in a Pentecostal church, she's just into it because she knows what I'm singing about, and she attaches that song to a memory somewhere. This morning when I was watching the video and I was looking at those years that have gone by in this revival, I'm able to attach those songs to events. Many of you, how many are married here today? How many when you were dating or courting or whatever you did, there was music that you and your betrothed listened to? Hold it up high. Yeah. Do you not have a certain emotion attached to certain songs? That was our song. When I hear that song, I remember how he used to hold my hand. When I got married, uh, the funny thing happened to me because all the places that I thought my wife really liked to go, after we got married, it all changed. You take your wife out to eat and you go to this restaurant and the place is romantic and you think this, she just loved this place. So it's your anniversary. We're going back to that place that we were together and you remember how it felt. And she looks at you across the table and doesn't want to spoil the moment, but she says, you know, I've never liked this place at all. <laughs> the food is awful and the service is worse. But honey, you love this place. No. She loved being with you. You could have taken her to a barn and fed her bologna, and she don't care. You could have eaten cheeseburgers on a park bench, and she don't care. It's that point of being with you that's important to her. But musically, I find emotion, the emotion is stirred with music. 
And see, that's not all bad. And this is not all about music today, so don't even go there. Some of you pastors already signed off. Because I want to tell you, there's a, great, there's a great gulf between pastors and musicians. There really is. In a lot of cases. Because we musicians are different. We really are. We're a weird bunch. I don't like any of us. And you'll rarely find a musician who likes himself. Most of the time, if he does like, him, like himself, he's not any good. And if he thinks he's good, he's really not any good. The only musicians I've found that really think they're all of that are in church. The people who are in, out there in the secular field working in studios and recording, they don't think they're all that great. They just play and they do their thing and they're very nice people. The threatened ones are in the church. This is my gig. Watch me. When I sing this song, everybody likes it. Watch. Like a bunch of little roosters walking around. Look at me, how good I am. I love what C.S. Lewis said about church music. C.S. Lewis said, Christian music, for the most part, is second-rate lyrics written to third-rate melodies. He was right. It's not our performance, and it's not our offering of excellence that is going to impress souls for Christ. It's reality. People can hear good music anywhere. They can buy a ticket and go hear the best. I think we need to refocus our attention. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. You know, we always believe that old adage, if we build it, they'll come. If we have a beautiful sanctuary and wonderful preaching and a great music program, people will come. Some will, but there's still a mass of people outside the door who don't know Jesus, and they're never going to come to the Browns of Revival. They don't care what I sing. They're on their way to hell, and what I sing inside these walls has very little difference to their lives. It's not going to make one change in them. Because if you have the greatest thing in the world, but nobody can ex access it, it isn't any good. It doesn't do me any good if you've got a million dollars and I need 500000 if I can't get to you and get a check from you. You can have the thing that will meet my need, but if I can't find where you are, and we've got this little idea in our little church world that everybody's waiting to come to our church. No, they aren't. They don't even want to come to your church because they equate church with something they won't want to be a part of. Now, that is universal, especially in evangelized nations like Europe. The thing that they call the church is a thing they don't want to be a part of. So where does this music thing fit in the kingdom of God? I think there's several areas. There's, there's evangelism. I believe in evangelistic music. I believe in getting out in the streets and playing something. Every great move of God had a music accompanying with us and it was, with it, and it was always the music that went with that particular time. Spurgeon, during his great campaigns, his music director would take secular songs and put Christian lyrics to them because he figured, one, people already know the melody. Two, we'll teach them some Christian lyrics to go with a familiar melody. So they were in their shower getting ready for church or in their tub or whatever they did to get ready for church back then, and they were singing, the daughter of Rosie O'Grady was a good old gal. They were singing that melody, but they were singing about the mighty acts and the power of the Lord. Where do you think we got such corny melodies as drinking from the springs of living water? I mean, that is a beer drinking song if I ever heard it. <laughs> I can guarantee you about the turn of the century, old John down at the bar was toasted singing another lyric to that. But isn't it amazing that we can't recall where that, that, that really came from?
Those of us in the kingdom of God drinking from the springs of living water. Now, some of you may not know that, but all of America, mostly, Church of God, Assembly of God, those people, they know that song. They heard it all their lives. I'm always looking for the can-can girls to come out because it's like... And it's amazing that when that song was written, it was the popular music of the world at the time. So I would call that evangelistic, you know. I'm figuring I'm going to take a, a, a record by Smash Mouth or somebody and put some lyrics to it and bring it in and just get thrown out of the church. You know, it's, it's probably getting about time for us to do Thriller. It's about 15, 20 years old. So I'm looking for Thriller to come along any time in church because we always wait about 20 years and then we sanctify it. <laughs> it's true. It's really true. It's really true. Uh, the evangelical church in America is really digging 70s schmaltz right now. They're really cool with that, but they're not going to go any further, but that, that's holy unto them. And the point I'm trying to make to you is in evangelistic music, I don't think there are any rules. I think go for it. If you're going to approach evangelism, just go for it. I don't care who it sounds like. Go after it. If you can stand on the street corner with a band and people will listen to you and you can draw, draw a crowd and preach to them about Jesus, go, baby, go. I mean, go for it with everything you've got. I believe in evangelistic music. I believe in that. But I also believe that what goes on in this place has a different dynamic. Now, in Brownsville, it's been, been kind of fun to try to figure out what to do because... We've had so many sinners come in. And then we have the saints here too. And I'm not really trying to pay attention to either one. To, I'm really worshiping the Lord. But I've asked the Lord to give me wisdom with the style of music that I choose that it would keep those who walk into this. See, Steve Hill and I, when we do a... When I work with Pastor Kilpatrick and we're doing the, a worship-oriented thing... I don't worry about anything but just worship. When I work with Steve Hill in Awake America or something like that, I'm always thinking about that peripheral guy out there who got here because somebody invited him. And I don't want to lose him before he gets the word. I want the glory of God to touch him but I don't want to lose him. So I approach music more aggressively and more evangelistically, more like what he would hear on the radio, something that, that, that's, that's kicking enough that he'll go, I can hang out for this. This ain't horrible. But I don't get into all the thought and paradigm of that because I'm here to worship. But somewhere along the line in church, not only in music, but in pastoral work, evangelism work, all these areas, we all started getting real brainy. It was sometime in the 80s we started thinking about what we were doing. When I was a little boy, we were just, we were the, those, those uneducated Pentecostals on the other side of the track. Really, that's what we were. We were just, we were, we were ignorant and proud of it. And we thought if you were smart, there's no way you could get into our, our little thing because we didn't want anybody smart because they might figure out something we we're doing wasn't exactly biblical. But it didn't matter to us. <laughs> we, were, we, were, we had a small circle and we stayed right inside of it. Right in the middle of that circle. And you know what's funny? I've observed the church through the years. And I've, I'm older than I look. Maybe not. I'm 36 years old. I was born in 63. And I remember watching many, many waves and different things come into the kingdom of God, come in the body of Christ across this nation. And I've noticed that, that as they come, they bring all their stuff with them and everybody gears up and goes and buys the books and everybody gets the cassettes and everybody jumps in. I remember when looking at where your, uh, what was the word? Oh, I loved it. It was good. Um, you look at your particular demographic. Now, if you're in Novario, where there's lots of Spanish folks or Mexican folks, you gear your church and your outreaches toward Mexican people. And if you have a church in Seattle, Washington, or in Dallas Metroplex, in North Dallas, 
you would gear your church around the influential type person. So that way, in the pew, you would have a doctor sitting next to a lawyer, sitting next to a judge, sitting next to the upper crust. You know, a bunch of crumbs stuck together with a little dough. Uh, you know what I'm saying. You, you would gear yourself toward those... That was a joke. Come on. Uh, do you know what I'm saying? If, and if you were in a particular area of poor people, you geared yourself toward that. And, and man, we went out and bought books. The church went nuts. We started getting demogra demographically correct. And the political correctness of secular mainstream just kind of jumped in the church. So suddenly we were demographically correct. We were politically correct. And then we figured out what a mega church was. We figured that if we applied certain rules of success, that we would wind up with a successful church. How many knows truth is truth, no matter what you do with it? And if truth works, truth works. Now it doesn't matter that it's God's truth, just because a business, a secular business makes a truth work. Because Microsoft uses a principle that works and makes a multi-billion dollar business. We decide, hey, work for them. Our churches are dying. We can't keep people interested. Why don't we figure out a leadership style that mimics that? Ah, good. That's like taking the music of the world and let's try that. So we tried it and guess what? Churches, it grew huge. Mega churches, mega mighty morphin churches. I mean, when I was a boy, a big church was 500 people. That was a big, big, I mean, that was the other side of town. That was, we never thought, I went to churches 30, 40, 50 people, and that was a big night. I mean, 500 people was unheard of. Now, in this nation, there's 10 and 20,000 in churches. Dr. Cho in Korea, 100,000 or so, 200,000, 600, 700,000. How many? How much? 750,000. That's your basic mega mighty morphin biggie biggie mega. I mean, that's big. Everybody say that's big. And you see, there's nothing wrong with that principle of applying it. I'm not shooting at that. But I'm saying we lost something along the way. I, as a little Pentecostal preacher's boy, my dad's sitting right over there. I grew up in his church. I saw the works of the Lord as a child, but somewhere along the road, I feel the Lord here. Somewhere along the road, I started trying to figure out how to be successful. I started trying to figure out how to make the thing work in my life. It began to consume my music, it consumed ministry, it consumed everything because I decided I grew up in a little small Pentecostal church, but I was going to do better. I was going to hang with the big boys. I was going to do something. And my idea of success was big. My idea of success was fame. And I went after it. I just went after it. And as I went after it, I lost myself. I lost myself and shipwrecked myself so miserably, so in such a miserable way that I could not, I lost my will, I lost my care. Somewhere, long about the beginning of the 1990s, I lost my will, my fire, my zeal, my passion, you see, the reason I can look at the people God brings into this place, in this revival, and I can read a lot of people just by looking in their eyes, is I see that same zeal and passion in some folks' eyes. But it's not a passion for the heart of God. It's a passion over what they know as success. And they go, I want this in my church. I want a revival in my church. And I'm just, 
I'm recalling in 1995 when I parked my car in Brownsville. I was a beat up, dried up, dead, about to give up. I was so sick of church. I had learned how to entertain people with a choir. I knew how to make white folks sway. That's a miracle. <laughs> I had learned how to make white folks sway when they sang. I would learned how to hit the right button, Lila. I could sing a song, and I knew what people wanted to hear. I'd hit a song, and they'd be in the aisles. But you see, what God has brought you to Brownsville this week for is to touch you with a higher thing. You're not here for what you'll learn in these sessions. You're not here for any reason you thought you'd come, but God wants to touch you with a higher thing. And when God touches you with a higher thing, when the high calling of the Lord comes upon you, you get dissatisfied with everything around you. And you suddenly become disillusioned with success. When I was, when 1995 rolled around, I'm, I was young. But I'm telling you, I think I'd seen it all, Dad. I'd been in tent revivals. I'd seen the sick healed. I'd been on the big television shows. I'd been on the big records. I'd seen all of that. And every time I would taste something, I would come back empty. You see, God has got a plan for your life and ministry here this morning. But keep in mind that you've got one too. And I'm not even going to blame your plan on the devil. It's yours. I think we poor, poor devil, I feel sorry for him sometimes. We blame him for everything. <laughs> sometimes it's just us. I sat down when I was 17, 18 years old and made my plan. And it was like a, I don't know, again, I'm talking to folks from other countries, so you bear with this old southern boy, okay? But it's like setting a big plate, a big place to eat, a big feast, a banquet, and all the food you could ever want is out on this table. And, and one bowl of it is what you want, and another bowl is what you wanted, and they're all the things that you've ever wanted. And the chef has prepared all of them and just set them before you. Now there is one particular dish on this table. There's an entree sitting on this table that you didn't order, and it don't look that good to you. It's probably green. <laughs> and it doesn't have any sugar. But everything else looks wonderful. And you tie on your napkin and head to the table. You get a spoon of this. But the difference in this banquet and most banquets is, as you put your spoon in the bowl and you pull it up and put it on your plate and you take a bite of it, it looks so delicious. But when you get a taste of it, it's not really what you wanted. Have you ever been hungry, but you didn't know what you wanted? Anybody been that way? You'll eat the whole house. <laughs> I used to talk to ladies. I used to counsel Weight Watchers. See, I used to be a heavy boy. And I used to counsel Weight Watchers. I used to tell these, these ladies and men who were trying to take some pounds off. That's only an American problem, I think, probably, because uh, we got so much. We're spoiled. But... I would say, listen, uh, ladies, if you want it, you need to go get it and get, eat a little of it because you're going to eat the whole house trying to get to what you want. If you want chocolate, go get chocolate because you'll eat 400 times more calories trying to get to what you want. Go ahead and go after what you want. I found that all of these things that God placed on this banquet table were all what I wanted. I had told him, Lila, at various times in my life, don't think God's not listening. Don't think he's not li He's listening. Even to the things you're praying for that is not even his plan. Sometimes he'll let you have them. Just to show you and to get it out of your system because he knows you're probably not any good to him until he does. I want a big church, God! Okay, here's your big church. Now you'll be calling me. You'll be calling me. <laughs> I want a great music program. I want to I cut a record. Okay. 
We'll let you cut a record. We'll let you be in debt about a half a million. Yeah, go ahead. Every time I would reach into these bowls, just theoretically speaking, and take a taste, it just wasn't what I wanted. I thought it would satisfy me. Do you notice there's not a lot of difference in that testimony than one that you hear of a person who's out in the world on drugs and alcohol and they're in illicit sexuality? Have you noticed there's not any difference in the testimony? It's just different stuff. I was out there, I thought if I tried this, I thought if I had fame, I thought if I had this. You see, I want to say this to you, and this is my message to you, and I am going to get to the Word of God, trust me. But this is my message to you today. From my heart, there's lots of things in the church that we think we want. But they won't bring satisfaction, they won't bring peace, and they won't bring the glory of the Lord. I said, God, I want to do this, I want to do that, and I got it all on my plate and had a taste of all of it and hated every bit of it. When I came to Brownsville, this was the green spinach. I was sick of big churches. I was tired of choirs. I was tired. If I had to deal with one more cantankerous singer who wanted a solo, I was going to strangle them. I'd look at them and go, honey, you ain't that good. Go home. You know, just get, I've done solos in this church for 25 years. God gave me this song. He gave it to you because he didn't want it. That's where I was. You understanding, I'm not dissing people and getting mad. I'm just telling you, this is where I was. I was just so tired of all of it. And see, when you get like that, you get self-righteous. When you get in that state of mind, you suddenly start getting like Elijah under the juniper tree. You suddenly think you're the only one. Everybody else is going to hell in a handbasket. You're the only one that still believes something. And God said, wait a minute, old boy. There are thousands that you don't know about. God was so gracious to me when he brought me to this place. He fixed me. He healed me. He changed me. And he set me free. I mean really free. And he touched me with something that I'm ruined. I am ruined now. I can't go back to church like I knew it anymore. I'm ruined. I mean, it's like if I have to get on the street and do this, I'm going to do it. I've got to go where there's a hunger. I want to be where there's hunger. If we've got to, oh dear, when you get touched by the fire of God, Satan will try to steal it from you. But when you get the fire of God truly burning in you, you are going to do the things of God. You're going to go after him. Nobody can stop you. You'll eventually get away from folks who don't want it. You change friends. You get rid of people in your life left and right. Not because you don't like them anymore. It's just they don't have the focus you have anymore. And you never rise above the people you hang around. Whoever you're hanging around, whatever they want from God, you will either pull them with you or be pulled down. Most of the time, you'll be pulled down. Now, let me read my scripture and get back on my notes. That was all the opener. No, I actually, I have time frame, so don't everybody leave. I see that hand. Okay. The seventh verse of Philippians 3. Now this is Paul saying this. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith 
in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God and is by faith. I want to know Christ in the power of his resurrection and in the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. I'm not even going to get past that with my notes. That's about all of my note I'm going to use because I feel the Lord here and I'm going to share with you what I feel God's saying. The Lord is looking upon this place today and He's looking across this audience and He's saying, is there anybody there who wants to know me? Is there anybody there who really wants to know me? Is there anybody who wants to be like me in my death? What does that mean? Christ in his death, before his, just the day before his death, is praying in a garden, saying, Father, if there's any way out, please let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, whatever you want me to take on, I'll take it on. I believe that God is moving across the world right now. And he's looking for somebody who wants to know him. We serve a God that he really doesn't need us, but he wants us. He wants our relationship. He wants our heart. He wants every ounce of what we have. He wants our 100% affection. He wants our 100% devotion. He wants everything. And I read this scripture, and I remember 1995. I remember I was so cocky and so arrogant and so self-centered. And I realized that I knew how to do church. I knew how to be religious. I knew what buttons to push. I had learned how to do it. But I realized that I was empty and that I really didn't know him. You know how you can tell whether folks know the Lord? Their conversation is the Lord. Their every heartbeat is the Lord. I believe God is about to pour something out, Lila, on the face of this earth. I believe there's a sound of heaven that's coming into the church and into the world. I believe that God is about to pour out miraculous things on his church. But he's looking for those that will know him, that will stand up and be trumpets to warn of what's coming and to tell people what's coming up upon the face of the earth, what God is about to do. But we've got to lift our vision higher than what we've known. We've got to build a bigger place. And I don't mean a, a building. We've got to build a bigger place here. We've got to open up here and realize, see, God has shown me I'm a little, I'm a little nothing. I am just absolutely nobody. I grew up, I should never have been heard from. Really. That people from the world come to this church and this revival amazes me beyond any words I could state. I don't understand it. I don't get it. But I know that God is doing something. And I'm telling you today that if God can find, there's one common thread that you'll find everybody here has in common. It's one thing, and it's this. We all are so desperate for God. After five years, I'm worn out. I really am. I'm physically tired. I'm exhausted. My voice is tired. I couldn't even sing yesterday morning after Tuesday night. I, my voice wouldn't work. I, I sounded like this. I was trying. And you know, in years gone by, Philip, I would have, I would have been burnt out and been tired of this. But God has done something in me. I don't even have words. I feel just totally unqualified this, this afternoon. I know some of you are tired, but I, I, I can't even get my heart to you. God wants to use you. 
He wants to use you. And he won't be stopped by where you are. He won't be stopped by how small or how big. He'll be stopped by one thing. When you would rather know the things about him instead of him. And you see, that's the danger that we are facing. Please hear my heart. We're facing it, Lila, in the church. Because these kids come up to me and these young men and women that have a call of God to be worship leaders. God has called them to be Levites under the kingdom of God. God has called them to usher in the new thing that God wants to do, the new sound from heaven. God wants, but you know what it is? Because they don't know, because people aren't standing up in the pulpits and saying there's more of God than what we have. There's a greater depth to God than what we know. There's more. I'm not talking about some mysterious new thing. God's doing the same thing he's always done. It's his kingdom. But there's more of him. There's depths to him we don't know. There's heights to him. And you see, Satan doesn't care if you go to church and you learn to be religious. He cares if you learn that there's more to this thing than sitting on the pew and leading a few songs and preaching a sermon. That scares him because he knows if you get close to God, you suddenly don't care about anything else. And you're like back in World War II, one of the most dangerous dangerous things that the Japanese had in that war. They had these little guys called kamikazes that would totally get in a plane, dive bomb, and lose their life. That's what God wants his people to be. Kamikazes. That's what Paul was. Paul was radical. He said, you know, I can't decide if I want to live or I want to die. I don't know. If I live, I'll live unto Christ. If I die, I'm going to see the Lord and that'll be a game. Paul wasn't particularly caring whether his church building was built. He didn't care if he was popular. He did get a little bit peeved because he wasn't ever a disciple. <laughs> he felt like they were mean to him because he, he, you know, he had some pedigree problems. So Paul wasn't all, he was a little human there too, occasionally. I love it when he goes, Paul, an apostle of Christ, not called by man. I love that. <laughs> he like, what, what, what's really in between the lines there is, you guys chose Matthias. Where is he? <laughs> Matthias Matthias who? And here I am getting beat and boiled and all this sort of thing, and you won't even let me in. But what I'm trying to say to you this morning, this afternoon, whatever it is, I've lost track of time, is God wants to do something. And, and you know, there's a lot of you in this place, you're going to have to go through some times to come to the end of your dreams. I found out that God is a faithful, faithful God. He's the, only, he's the only being in the universe that can take you somewhere you don't want to be, doing something you don't want to do, and make you like it. I got a word for you from the Lord. You want to hear it? I got the will of God for you. If you've got two doors open, whichever one you don't want the most is the Lord. I don't have to even speak in tongues to tell you that. I can tell you that flat-footed. I don't even have to feel anything to tell you that. I, I got an idea, another one. If God is calling you, if you have a couple of doors open and one is Hawaii and the other's Cuba, God says Cuba. <laughs> even a better one. If you've had a dream all of your life that you want to pursue in the kingdom of God, you've wanted to be a singer or a great pastor like Jack Hayford, and you see two roads to go down, whichever one that will take you the longest to get there, that's the one God wants you to go. Because God can't use us as long as we have a will. As long as we have a dream left in us, God can't use us. Somebody said, well, that's wrong. That's wrong. We've got to have vision. Vision and dream is a different thing. I have no more dreams 
I'm done with them. I really don't. I'm a young man with no dreams. But I have a vision. Because I wanted to do this 10 years ago. I wanted to reach the nations with music. I wanted to raise up a generation of worshipers that would reinstitute 24-hour worship. I wanted to see some incredible things happen 10 years ago. Now I don't really care. What got quiet? What did you mean? You quit? You decided to quit? No, I decided to stop trying to do it myself. And I realized that I drag my corpse up here behind this keyboard every night in the middle of this revival and wherever God opens a door and I worship my Lord and I figure the things of his kingdom he's going to make happen. And if I'm faithful, I get to be a part of it. And you know what? I found out what Reinhardt found out, that I spent most of my time trying to talk God into doing something I wanted Him to do. I spent most of my time making a plan and asking God to bless it. I figure whatever He's planned, He's already blessed. Why not just jump into what He's doing? Now that's easy to say, but sometimes it'll stretch you. Boy, whoo. It will pull you, it will stretch you, it will make you mad, it will make you angry. Let me tell you something funny. This is just me. I just have to talk. Y'all just have to. I remember standing behind this keyboard at the beginning of a revival, and, and I just wrote Steve a note and passed it to him this morning. I said, Steve, you don't have no idea how much I love you. You have no idea. I love Steve Hill like a brother. When he first came here, he was the embodiment of everything I didn't like. Because I grew up, you see, when I say, to those of you visiting from other countries, when I say I grew up Pentecostal, Pentecostal in this nation wasn't like it was anywhere else. It meant that all the preaching was, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> they basically screamed at you for 45 minutes and expected you to like it. You know, instead of praying for people to receive the Holy Spirit, you know, just touch them, Lord. I mean, they would literally open your mouth and stick the Holy Spirit down in. <laughs> say Jesus, 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 Jesus. Okay, keep saying it until you can't say anymore. Jesus, that's it. You got it. Then we got better at it in the, in the, in the 80s. We learned how to just don't pray in English. Okay, shalash ning bach, no, i that's the Holy Ghost. Well, there's a little problem with that. The Scripture says the Spirit gives utterance, but I won't go there. Um, I remember standing behind that keyboard and listening to Steve Hill preach. Now, his preaching then is a little different. If, you'll get, if you will get the tapes, you'll see. It was about 20 minutes long. Oh, for the good old days. Uh, it was about... I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Steve, I'm kidding. That was a joke. Steve's sermon was real short, real simple, but then his altar call was 45 minutes. And I remember listening to him preach. You understand my arrogance. You have to understand, when you've been raised in the pedigree of the church, you've heard the greatest speakers that ever graced a pulpit. Hallelujah that knew how to speak the oracles of God with distinct eloquence. And they understood how to use the right vernacular and they could move you and cause your emotion to rise and fall on every word. <laughs> You're laughing because you know somebody like that, don't you? I wonder how they are when they're in the shower. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, hallelujah. You imagine when they're at home, honey, I would like some coffee. <laughs> so growing up this way, you know, you can get real arrogant and proud, you know, and I was, I was all of it, king daddy right here. 
And when this revival began, here was Steve. Now, I had been touched by the Lord about in it, just about a month before revival came. God really did a work in my life. But he did it in a church that didn't do any of that. Matter of fact, it was a vineyard church. And vineyard churches are about as opposite of how I grew up as you can get. It's the other end of the spectrum. But God used that church, Vineyard, to touch my life and to change me. And I so got a hold of the idea of worship that I didn't want to sing any of those mad Pentecostal songs anymore. I, I just didn't want, to, I didn't want to do it. You can look at the videos and understand in the beginning of this revival, there was no enemy's camp. I refused to do it. I didn't. I just wanted to worship. God had so ripped all the stuff out that all I wanted to do was worship. Now, I thought I was really dead. I thought God had really ripped a lot of stuff out until I got back from the Ukraine, and here was Steve Hill. <gasps> and I was going, let God do it, man. Just settle down. Let God do it. It's hard. I'm speaking to some of you. I got to close, but I want you to hear this. I sat there and st I've said this to Steve, so this is no shock to him. I sat there and went, now listen, I want you to hear, I'm, I'm being honest with you. It's okay if I be honest. Transparency here, okay? We're just brothers. Why don't we get all that religious mess all of us anyway? I thought, I can preach as good as he can. I mean, he ain't much of a preacher. He's got an altar call, yeah. And I would sit there and get mad at God because the greatest revival that had ever come in my lifetime was happening and I was behind the keyboard again. I said, God, why is it always, I'm a preacher, why do I always, did you not call me to preach when I was 17? Why am I behind the, the piano player, that's the guy you throw a songbook at. I mean, he's the guy who gets fired. Now I want you to hear what's going on in me. Why, why me, God? I mean, nobody wants to be a musician. If you're going to really have a position of authority in the church, it ain't going to be from behind a keyboard. Why in the world? Here I am again. And nobody even mentions my name. Nobody cares about me. Here I am. What is this about? Do you just hate me? Probably two, three months into this revival, God was beating the daylights out of me. I was crying. I, the glory of God would come, and I was too mad. Now see, you, don't, you didn't realize that, did you? That lets you know that what you're dealing with in your life is none the different. There's no difference. We are all human beings that God is trying to turn into the character of Christ. And He'll use whatever means He has to. Now, I will tell you that I am happy to scrub the toilets in this church and don't care. If anybody knows who I am, it doesn't matter. I don't care if I stay behind the keyboard because I've got an idea that God's about to do something in worship and we might just get redeemed musicians. We might just get some redemption here if we'll get rid of our egos and get rid of our careers and get rid of our ideas and find a place at the feet of Jesus and kiss him a little bit and make love to him and love on him and let him know that our heart beats for him and we really mean it because he knows. I love God. He knows really what you're all about anyway. And God will just pull that out of us and I have a feeling that something's about to happen that's going to break a lot of barriers down. But do you see it's a process? And many of you here today, some of you are broken, some of you are hurting, some of you are discouraged. You're discouraged because things aren't happening in your ministry. You've gotten touched by God and you can't figure out why nobody else around you wants to be touched. Just let me let you know something to comfort you. It happens to everybody, and let me let you know that God did not touch you for no reason. He had a purpose in touching you, and it may not be for even where you are. God may be putting a fire in you to move you out of the place you are. He could be putting a fire in you so that when the fire comes, you'll embrace it. Because some, some of us, if we're not on fire for God, we are so egotistical in our ministries that if it doesn't happen through us, if John Kilpatrick had had an enormous ego when this revival came, John Kilpatrick was an in-charge fella here, okay? I want you to understand what my pastor, he was the guy who would call people down from the pulpit. He was the guy who would, who would <laughs> invite people not to come back. He stood behind that pulpit, said, uh, Sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so, why don't you stand up?
He said, I just want the church to know that these people are troublemakers, they're liars, and they're backbiters, and they're not welcome in this church anymore. Don't eat with them, don't talk to them, leave them alone. Go, go. Because he had dealt with them, he had talked with them with the board, he had gone to them, as scripture said, two, three, four times, and they would not shut their mouth. So finally, he just gets up one Sunday morning, high church. Uh, I mean, it's high church. He goes, uh, stand up. Yeah, the, this is so and so, so and so. We have dealt with these people. They're troublemakers. From this day forward, don't fellowship with them, leave them alone. They're not welcome here. Now, turn to your Bibles. That is John Kilpatrick. And everybody in this town knew that was John Kilpatrick. Now, let me show you John Kilpatrick revival. For, I got to shut up. The first four or five months of the revival, he didn't know what happened in anything. You know, they were talking about looking at each other. It was Steve and I going, what do we do now? He's out again. <laughs> and do you know what, really? Do you know what the first crowds were that came to this revival? It was the local people. They wanted to see what happened to John Kilpatrick. Because they knew this was the same guy that was on television, this very, you know, strong man with a lot of backbone, and all of a sudden he's flopped over in the chair like a rag doll, and they don't know what to do with him. He would get so bad that we'd have to move him back here on the sound console and put a pillow and a towel to catch the drool. Now, if you don't think that'll cause people to come, that will cause people to... And when they would come, God would touch them, and the rest is history. Isn't it fun to see what God does? But I'm telling you, God, God wants to do it for you. But he may have to move you out of the way. If God had not prepared John Kilpatrick when this revival happened with that kind of public humiliation, and then all of a sudden you've got an evangelist in here preaching seven services a week. John Kilpatrick preaching only Sunday morning. And suddenly a guy that Pastor John knew, but none of the rest of us knew, was preaching seven services a week. Tell me, Pastor, do you really want revival? Do you want God to bring another guy in to fill your pulpit seven times a week while you just stand by and drool on yourself? <laughs> How bad do you want revival? Sometimes God, and I feel like God is going to touch some of you this week before you leave tomorrow afternoon or, or Saturday or whenever you have to leave. If you will allow God to touch you in a powerful way, I guarantee you one thing, that when you leave this place, God will have set you on fire. He will have made a change in your life if he hasn't already. And trust me, when God puts a fire in you, when you go home, don't let it go out. Let us all say that I may know him. I count my ministry as nothing. I count my years of preparation as nothing. I shut up with this. I'm, I'm over my time, but who hadn't gone over their time around here? Huh? 2.45? Oh, hallelujah. I don't know if the keyboard's on, but I want, you, I want to show you how, one more thing that God does when he, brings, when he brings you into what he's wanting you to do, to let you understand that it's not about you, it's not about me. Yeah, you can hear that. Here's, here's something real funny, wrong mic. When I came to Brownsville, I had spent years learning how to play this uh, gospel stuff. All that kind of stuff and all these kind of... Uh, And in revival, God would not let me play any of it. He has fire in his eyes. The, those of you who know music, that's two tones. There's not even a third in that chord. Everything that I had rehearsed 
and practiced and learned how to do was not useful when God brought revival. It's so not about me. It's so not about you. It's so not about our performance. And pastors, I just want to release you in the name of Jesus. Don't beat yourself up anymore thinking that you're not educated enough, you're not good looking enough, you don't know how to preach good enough for God to use. For the Lord says to you this morning that I called you, I placed you where I've put you. The Lord says, I've placed my hand upon you. And when I have placed my anointed one, when I have placed my angel over a church, the gates of hell shall not prevail. The Lord says, when I have put my hand upon you and I have called you unto myself, I did not call you to man's ideas. I did not call you because I touched you. I touched you in a year and a time that only you and I know about. You know the day that I touched you and I called you. And I called you as deep unto deep, says the Lord. I called you from the inside. I called you to the place that the very inside of your being trembled at my voice. And you said to me, yes, Lord, I'll do what you've called me to do. But the Lord says you have not because you've allowed men's ideas and their wisdom to overcome you and you've allowed them to confuse you and you've allowed them to break your heart and you've allowed them to steal out of you the vision that the Lord has put upon you you have caused your vision to be turned this way and that and you've moved into a defensive mode of maintaining and the Lord says today I call you out of that I put you on the front line. I put you on the offensive. The Lord says, I've brought you here to heal you. I've brought you here to revive again the calling that I placed in you years ago. I've brought you here to revive you. I've brought you here to change your life. I've brought you here to rekindle and to stir again the gift that I've put within you. The Lord says, think not that the things that you've gone through have not gone, have gone without my notice. The Lord says, I've seen, I've seen, I've watched those who've come against you. I've watched those who've desired to lead you down the wrong path. And the Lord says, I will cause their snares to be turned upon them. I will cause their their gallows to be the noose around their neck because the Lord says, my precious one, my beloved one, I've called you to purity and the thing in you I admire and love and desire the most is a broken heart of humility. So the Lord says, allow my spirit today to flow on you. Allow my anointing to pour on you as it did Aaron. And allow me, says the Lord, to wash away, to wash away all those things because I have given you, ooh, whoa. I have already given you the city. I have already given you the place where you have put your feet. The Lord says, I have already foreordained it. But Satan, the enemy, has desired to put blinders on you, to not realize the place that you're in is the place I have called you. And even in your heart, even in your heart, you have said, Lord, how much longer must I stay in this place? And the Lord says, I have not even begun my work in that place because I have allowed you to go through the tests and I've allowed you to go through the trial of your faith that you would come out as pure gold. And the Lord says, I am about to pull you out of the fire. I'm about to pull you out of the fire and pour you in the mold and place you in a place where you will be seen by the nation and the cities around you and by the townsmen and by the villagers around you, says the Lord. I will show you off as my prize because you laid still. The Lord says today, I break 
those things off of you and set again my calling within you, my blessed holy calling that called into the deep part of your soul that you have allowed, you've allowed Satan to trample down. The Lord says, today, I rebuild, I rebuild, I restore, I return to you a hundredfold that that the enemy has tried to steal. I return to you, ooh, I return your son to you. I return your daughter to you. I return your relatives to you, says the Lord. Those that have broken your heart will become your servant, says the Lord. Those that have desired to destroy you, I will remove out of the picture because my kingdom is coming upon you my kingdom is coming upon you says the Lord hallelujah 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 give the Lord glory come on lift him up lift up your voice yes Lord yes Lord yes Lord yes Lord Oh, yes, Lord. My, my, my. That wasn't in my notes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's some destiny on you folks in this place. There is some destiny on some people in this place. I expect to hear what God's doing. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. I've got to shut up. May the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. May your enemies run and scatter before you seven ways. May the blessings of the Lord keep you. May every financial thing you touched for the kingdom of God be blessed. May your family be blessed and the peace of the Lord reign in you and be with you and be on you and your household. I bless you in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. God bless you. Hallelujah. I guess the next...